Hello. Welcome to the snow. This is going to be a slipping and sliding commentary along with my running commentary because there's a lot of snow here in Central Park, New York City, but it's a beautiful day and it's a special day in the Jewish calendar. I wanted to connect with you and with the date and talk about it a little bit real quickly. Today's the 22nd day of Shvat. Chaf Bey Shvat. It is the date on which the Rebbe's wife, the Rebbitzin, passed away. Um, don't know exactly how many, in 1988. So it's a day that we commemorate, speak about her and some of her lessons, life lessons. And I'm um, going to share a few quick stories and we're going to dive into a Dvar Torah about this week's Torah portion, Yisrael. So, one beautiful story that was told, this is not working, told by the driver, one of the Rebbe's, the Rebbe's drivers. She was, they were going somewhere, I think it's somewhere in Queens, and they rerouted, um, they didn't have a GPS, but there was some construction or some building, something happened that caused them to reroute their regular route. And on the way, um, on the way in that rerouting, they heard a cry of a woman, literally crying, screaming. The Rebbitzin asked the driver to stop the car, go out and find out what's going on. And what she did, the driver comes back and said, there's a woman with all her belongings, a family actually, with all their belongings, their home belongings were out on the street. The marshal was there and they were going to, they were evicting her from the home because she couldn't pay the rent. So the Rebbitzin, the Rebbe's wife asked the driver to find out what, the amount of rent it is that she needs to pay. The marshal was there. <laughs> and see if he would accept a check, a personal check, which he did. And she just wrote out a check for that full amount. It was a few months worth of rent. They say, it was in the, I think it was in the $15,000 range. And whatever it was, that was the story. That was one story. Story number two. Oh, oh, so the driver, you know, obviously, you know, it was a good deed, uh, but he asked about it. He said, what made you decide to do this? So the Rebbitzin responded, interestingly, it wasn't just a random act of kindness, but there was also something else that she said that her father, who was the previous Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson, of blessed memory, taught her that if ever there's a change of course, we know God directs the steps of man. It's always that way. But, and we always look for the opportunities and privileges and challenges um, to figure out why we were there and make the, the most of it. But in this specific situation, she said, especially when you're rerouting, when your route takes you, your travels take you in a different place than you intended to, then there's definitely a clear reason for you to be there. You need to find that reason and deal with it. So that was one story. Another story was just many, many people told stories about how they came. The Rebbitzin, the Rebbe's wife, was a royal, regal person, majestic. She was, they say, short in stature, but a giant of a human being. And there's countless stories that representing that, demonstrating that, um, that many people tell who were friendly people. When she came into the home, she always made sure to make the people feel great, comfortable, great, extraordinary, special. And she had a knack for it in a, in a unique way. One rabbi, Lou, told us that it's the first time he came to meet 
the Rebbiton in her home with his family, there was some drink that she served. She always drank, she always served cake and drinks, whoops, and candies to children. And she insisted that people take it. And Rabbi Lou had spilled the drink on the table. And it was a colorful drink and he was very upset. And she, the Rebbiton, responded so powerfully and beautifully saying, wow, it's a sign of blessing. When you spill something, it's a semen bracha. It's a sign of blessing. And she kept on praising him. And he was a little child, I don't know, five, six, seven years old, maybe 10. And he said that he felt like he wanted to spill, he wanted to spill another cup because she made him feel so good. And another little story with a, a family came and, um, and she had a cake there and she was cutting the cake for the cutting pieces of cake for the children and a five-year-old child wanted to take the knife she was screaming I want to cut it I want to cut it and she's holding this sharp knife it wasn't appropriate for this five-year-old child so the parents waiting breathlessly what is going to happen how will she manage this of course they did what they could but the bottom line is she the Rebbitson said oh I see you you want to cut the cake. You know, if you cut it, you might cut a small a small piece. And I'm, a, I'm an experienced cutter. I want you to have a big piece. So please, let me cut it for you. I'll give you a very big piece. Which she did. So just to make him feel good. And another short story is about this woman. This was told, I heard it last night from a rabbi. His name is Shem Rokeach. He related that his mother was going out on her date to meet her intended and she was at the Rebbe's the Rebbe's house and this, this was her first date and as he she was there she looked at her and she said oh, you okay? somebody fell okay she slipped it's slippery here I hope I don't slip it's literally icy this is the exact spot where I tore my plantar fascia, right here, right here by this building, on this, on that, on that incline a few months ago. But Baruch Hashem, I'm back. So the Rebbitson looked at her and said, do you have jewelry that you can bring along? And she didn't have any jewelry more than she was wearing. Rebbitson took her own diamond necklace. She said, here, take, take my necklace. You're going on your, on your first date. You deserve to be wearing something special, extraordinary. And she gave her her own personal diamond necklace. That was the story that I, those are the few stories I wanted to share about the Rebbitson. And the Rebbe, when she passed away, the Rebbe said her name was Chaya Mushka. And Chaya means life. Um, and the Rebbe said, V'achai yitein alibo, the living should take to heart. And, and should take lessons from her life, and, uh, which are many, and we just spoke about a few of them. And another thing, the Rebbe also asked to have an organization, a charitable organization, established with her name, Harabitsen Harabanit Chaya Mushka. That's, and those are the initials of Hachomesh. Harabanit Chaya Mushka Schneerson Hachomesh. And this charitable organization helps uh, families in need and brides in need. And the link is in there for you to contribute. I get no commission. No. No tracking on this, um, so you can donate as you please. The Rebbe also said to donate in the amounts of the numerical equivalent of her name, which is 470. The gematria is 470, so you could give 47 cents, 47 dollars, 47 hundred dollars, 470 dollars, 47 million dollars, as you wish, etc. Now I'm going to move on real quickly to 
the Dvar Torah, which is this week's Parsha is Yisro. Yisro, or Yitro, as Israelis would have it. It starts off, Vayishma, Vayishma Yitro. And Yitro heard. What did he hear? And why was he there? And another question is, why is it that the whole experience, the greatest experience of all times, which was the revelation of God at Mount Sinai to the Jewish people, happens in this week's Torah portion, named Yisro. Why? So the Zohar says, and I'm quoting very quickly, a uh, talk from the Rebbe about this, the Zohar says that the Torah could not have been given had not Yisro come. And one of the reasons is because Yisro was the world's expert on deities, on religions, on worship, and all kinds of worship. He knew them all, he tried them all. And when he came and said, Baruch Hashem, blessed is Hashem, and he said, Atayadati, now I know, Kigadol Hashem, Mikololokim, that God is greater than all other forms of deity, that our God is the true God. So that was the straw that the world needed to break the back of, of uh, Galut, of the exile, before uh, Matan Torah, before the Torah was given. And then the Torah could have been given, which it was. So, what brought Yisra? Now that I know that Yisra was important, the question is, what brought him? What did he hear that convinced him to come? There are a few answers to that in the Midrash and the Talmud. The one that the Rebbe talks about here is Milchemet Amalek, the war against Amalek. The Jewish people were on the way to Mount Sinai to get the Torah, to get the Ten Commandments, and this nation, this one nation, Amalek tried to prevent them. They tried to obstruct their path in war. And the Jewish people battled Amalek. They won and they overcame. Yisro heard about that, that they battled and won Amalek. He said, I'm in with these people. I'm coming because I know they will endure forever. Why and what is Amalek for us today? So there's a biblical requirement, wipe out, eradicate, eliminate, nuke, completely vanquish the, the memory, the mention of Amalek. Now, what is Amalek today? It's not the nation. We don't know who they are. We don't kill people today. It's, some people do, but we don't. Amalek says the Rebbe, the spiritual version of Amalek is doubt. The numerical value of Amalek is 240. 240 is also the numerical value of the word safek in Hebrew. Safek, samach, fe, kuf. 60, 80, and 100. It's 240. The Rebbe says that Amalek, what did they try to do there? They try to cast doubt on the Jewish people. They try to curb their enthusiasm from going to get the Torah. And the Rebbe says today, God gives the Torah every single day. Baruch HaTashem, we say, Noten HaTorah, every morning. In our morning prayers, we say that. In our morning blessings, Baruch HaTashem, Noten HaTorah. He gives the Torah. He gives it to us today. So in order to get the Torah, we have to go through the same method, system, that happened then. The Jewish people battled and conquered Amalek. We too have to battle and conquer our internal Amalek, which is doubt. What kind of doubt are we talking about? Says the Rebbe that when you're, when you learn Torah, you know what to do, you know what the mitzvot, which mitzvot God requires, expects of us, and then a little voice inside comes and says, really? Do I have to do this? Is it true? Is it real? And doubt creeps in. Says the Rebbe, doubt is a normal, natural thing. But what we need to do is kill it, eliminate it. And if you can easily eliminate it, and here's the method, if you can easily eliminate it by figuring out why your doubt is unfounded, fine, do it. But if there's any more, if there's any effort involved, the Rebbe says, without a doubt. Just 
do it without a doubt. Ignore the doubt. The Rebbe says, don't battle them. Don't conquer them. Because some doubts will not be easy to conquer and to explain away. So when you're, you see that a doubt is interfering with your service of God, the Rebbe says, don't play with it. Don't mess with it. Don't even deal with it. Completely ignore it. You're too busy doing what you need to do. You're too busy learning Torah. You're too busy doing the, observing the mitzvot and making this world a better place in ways that only you can. So without a doubt, leave the doubt alone. And the Rebbe said that in the original story of Amalek, also a similar thing happened where the Torah describes in the Midrash that the nation of Amalek, there were these great magicians and astrologers, and they were able to handpick people for their army who will not die. Magically, they will just not die that year. They were not going to die, and they didn't. So the Rebbe says that, whoops, these are people who were destined to live. All the, the whole army, the soldiers of Amalek were destined to live. They were not going to die. Nevertheless, the Jewish people conquered them. They didn't kill them, but they conquered them. What is this conquering? Says the Rebbe, they subdued the opposition. They didn't kill them. They didn't completely do away with them, but they didn't allow them to interfere with their mission. Their mission was to go to Mount Sinai. They went to Mount Sinai. They didn't allow them to interfere. Says the Rebbe, when we have doubts creeping up, internal doubts, you're not always going to kill them. Just don't allow them to interfere with your mission and move on. Now, how do you do that? How do you just move on if the doubt is really tough and strong? Says the Rebbe, look back into the Torah and we see that the battle, the men on the battlefield on the Jewish side, Moses, Moses, Moshe said to Yeshua, Bichar Lanu Anashim, choose for us men, real men. Who are these real men? Rashi says, Anche Moshe. These were the men of Moshe. Moshe's men. So the Rebbe says, if you're a man of Moshe, if you're connected to the Moshe Rabbeinu, to the leader of the Jewish people, and you're inspired, and you're receiving his inspiration and his teachings, and you're connected with him, you will overcome the doubts, and you will win. Anche Moshe. The Rebbe says that every generation has its Moshe. Our Rebbe tells us that his Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, was the Moshe of his generation. We see our Rebbe, the Lubavitch Rebbe, as the Moshe Rabbeinu, as the one leader who cared for and fought for and dedicated his life, along with his Rebbeton, with his wife, his life and his wife, to care for you and me, for all the Jewish people and for the whole world. So let's be inspired by his teachings and we have the power to overcome the enemy, Anche Moshe. God, whoa! <laughs> I am, this is like a miracle that I didn't fall because it's really slippery. God bless you all. Have a great day. Say Lachaim.